Well, by contestable market, we mean a market where um, there are low sunk costs, that's costs that can't be recovered by a new entrant if they were then forced to leave the industry. Uh, there should not be a significant brand loyalty for the incumbent or established firms. And there should be perfect knowledge. Uh, that means a new entrant has the ability, uh, like the incumbent, to, to, to make the product. Uh, uh, the incumbent doesn't have any extra knowledge they've built up over the years. Um, that Those three conditions would make a market pretty much perfectly contestable. What costs are likely to be sunk? Um, marketing costs are often uh, given as an example of a cost that, that's likely to be sunk. Any marketing a new entrant is going to have to, um, to do uh, to establish themselves in an industry, uh, they've lost that if they, if they leave the industry. Um, any technology that a new entrant has, has had to buy uh, and is obsolete by the time they leave the industry and they cannot sell on, that's likely to be a sunk cost. Uh, depreciation represents a sunk cost depreciation of capital even if they can sell it on when they leave the industry and perhaps specific capital as well uh, immovable capital which perhaps is in a certain place uh, pipelines uh. well the theory of contestable markets differs from classical theory uh, in, importance, in, in an important sense. The classical theory of the firm says that if we observe a market with maybe one or two or three dominant firms in the market, we can make the assumption there must be barriers to entry. But that's different with contestable markets. We might observe a monopoly with one dominant firm in a market, but we cannot be sure that it's not contestable. Perhaps that monopoly, which is in the market, controlling a market, is only maintaining its monopoly position because it chooses to limit price and not attempt to profit maximize. If it were to try and profit maximize, it might be faced with all kinds of hit and run new entrant firms. And so it maybe has made a choice to, to put uh, market dominance ahead of immediate profit and chooses to um, limit price, that is, operate at a price which is low enough to deter new entrants from entering the industry but still high enough for them to make some kind of profit. Well, the implication for government policy is that governments cannot make the assumption, like I mentioned earlier, governments cannot make the assumption that if there is a small number of firms, uh, an oligopoly or a monopoly in a market, um, that these firms are able to exploit the market. With contestable market theory, perhaps the market is contestable and perhaps the government has no need to, to regulate that industry because the, the, the very contestability of the market itself is, is regulating the industry and forcing the incumbent firms to, to behave themselves, to not make excessive profits. If they were to do so, they would be, they would be challenged by a new entrants. So the message to government policy must be that each market must be looked at and individually, uh, must have its contestability assessed individually to see whether there is a need for regulation. Without contestable market theory, there might be an assumption that every market has to be, uh, has to be regulated if it, if it is an oligopoly or a monopoly. Contestable market theory suggests no, a case-by-case, market-by-market approach where contestability is assessed is required because the market may be self-regulating in that it may be contestable. Um, how can we assess the contestability of a market? Well, I suppose we could just say, oh, we can, we can look to see are there some costs, is there brand loyalty, is there perfect knowledge? But I prefer a slightly more detailed um, checklist. Uh, of, of ways in which we can assess the contestability uh, of the market. Um, perhaps one thing is to look at the level of technology. 
the more technology there is, perhaps the more expensive it is for a, a new entrant to get into the market. Um, the car manufacturing uh, industry is an example where it's very expensive capital is required to get into the to get into the industry. That needn't necessarily reduce the contestability if that uh, if that capital can be sold on were the firm to be pushed out. But generally, high setup costs can reduce the contestability of the market. Secondly. Uh, the, the rate of change of technology in the industry. The more rapid the, the, the technology advances in an industry, the more likely the market is to be non-contestable because it's more likely that when the new entrant eventually leaves the industry, they're going to find that the technology they have is obsolete and difficult to sell on, or difficult to sell on without uh, large depreciation. That will reduce the contestability. A third factor is brand loyalty. The more brand loyalty incumbent firms have, the more difficult it will be for new entrants to break that brand loyalty and get sales. Uh, and it's going to cost them a lot of money in marketing to break the brand loyalty of the, of the incumbent. And that, that, that initial marketing push has to represent some costs. A further uh, factor that with which we can assess the contestability is the is the existence of symmetrical or asymmetrical information in the industry. When a new entrant enters the industry, to what extent are they in a position immediately or very quickly to make products um, as well as the incumbent firm? Is there a learning curve? Are they going to incur much higher average costs as they learn uh, the intricacies of the market? If such asymmetric information exists, it reduces the contestability of the market. Um, perhaps one more uh, factor by which we can assess the contestability of the market is to say, well, have any new entrants come in? Um, in some surprising industries, there, have, there, there has been uh, new entrants which have established themselves in an industry and, and in a surprising way in an industry which had been considered quite non-contestable. For example, the, the airline industry in Europe, the arrival of Ryanair, EasyJet and other budget airlines um, really show that this was a market that was more contestable than people realised. The first is that uh, it's rather imprecise. No market is perfectly contestable, perfectly non-contestable. So we can only really talk in terms of degrees of contestability. And that's rather imprecise. Quite contestable, very contestable, more contestable, less contestable. What do, these, what do these terms mean? So it's all a little imprecise and that's a criticism. A second uh, criticism would be that it can be very difficult to assess the contestability anyway, assessing things like the level of asymmetric information for a new entrant. Very difficult to measure and, and that weakens or, or sort of uh, restricts our ability to make any assumption on contestability. But perhaps the strongest criticism of the contestable market theory is this basic assumption that, that incumbent firms are worried about new entrants, that they, that they are scared of the impact of a new entrant and so they dare not profit maximise. Who's to say that an incumbent won't just, won't just profit maximise and worry about the new entrants when they come in? Or who's to say that all incumbent firms in all markets worry in the, to the same degree about the potential new entrants. Um, and so this doesn't deny that markets may or may not be contestable, but, but shakes the kind of found foundations in, in the sense of the expected response of the incumbents to the, to the potential threat of new entrants. We can't make that assumption about how incumbents will react to the threat of a new entrant. And so whether a market is contestable or quite contestable or not contestable at all doesn't make any difference because we can't predict the response of the incumbent anyway.